Uh, thank you for being here this morning. We'll, uh, we'll go over some of the things that are coming up in a few minutes, but let's go ahead and uh, turn to Proverbs chapter 3 this morning as we are continuing our series on uh, the home, particularly passing on wisdom. And the book of Proverbs has a great deal to say about that uh, as it comes to our home. I mentioned last week, no area of ministry, or no area of our world today do I think is uh, as challenged as our homes are. Uh, I, think, uh, our, I think Satan is attacking our homes. I think our society is attacking our homes. And so we have to be proactive. Now, let, in, in relation to that, let me, uh, let me point something out. Here's a little book here called Impress Faith on Your Kids. This is something that a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. But I have about eight or nine copies of here that are for free. I want to encourage you, if you, uh, if you are, uh, have children at home or, or if you have grandkids, pick up a copy of this this morning and read it. It's not a very long read, uh, just about 100 pages, not even that. And uh, just some things that we're going to be talking about today about impressing faith on our kids. When, when I begin Clearview Church, one of the things that we wanted it to be about was to strengthen families uh, and to help families. And uh, there's a lot of areas that, that I need help in, and so I want to be a help to you in those areas as well. So we're in, we're in Proverbs chapter 3, and um, let's begin reading in verse 1. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we will begin reading in verse 1. Solomon says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of years of life, for length of days and years of life, and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. Father, thank you for your word. We want to thank you for this truth. I pray today that you would uh, use it, or that you would make it a part of our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And you may be seated. Let me just check again. How many, it doesn't matter who you're a fan of, how many avid football fans do we have here? You kind of like to watch football, all right? Two, three, okay, good. Um, one of the things, football is exciting. It is my favorite sport uh, to, to watch, not necessarily to play, all right? Uh, Monopoly is my favorite sport to play. But, uh, you know, uh, it's one of my favorite to watch. And uh, one of the things that, that over the last few years has really developed uh, that's almost fun to watch is during the game when someone makes a touchdown. There, especially in the NFL, there has begun a new trend of uh, these touchdown dances. And it's like, uh, now, I'm not going to do one. You can rest easy, all right? I did think about maybe doing a worm or, or something up here, some of the things that those guys do. But, but um, one of the things that's always fun to watch is these professional players, as they run into the end zone and they have scored, they have put points on the board, it's like that they sit around during the week trying to figure out what they're going to do uh, when they get in that end zone because a touchdown is just a significant part of the game. Really, it's the objective of the game. I mean, when you think about it, you play football, of course, to win, but the only way that you can win is by putting points on the board. And the only way that you can put points on the board is by a, a touchdown. Now, I know some of you will say, no, no, you 
Would you say, can you go? Bill Gold. But here's the thing. Most coaches, when they have to opt for a field goal over a touchdown, they're disappointed. Like, man, we really want to score. We want to get in to the end zone because that is the idea of winning. Uh, and and that's, that's the whole objective of football. Well, as we take that theme and we move to the home, we want to win in our homes. I believe this morning that everybody in here, we want our families to win. We want to have winning teams. And we talked about that uh, this last few weeks. We talked about having, having a balanced team. That mom and dad have to work together. And there has to be tenderness. And there has to be toughness. And, and, and how that can change. Uh, and, and all of those things. But also, uh, one week David talked about how you have to have integrity. First and goal. The objective in the home is that mom and dad have to have Christ as the center and that their home has to be full of integrity and that they are who they are, whether they're at home or away from home. Anything else is going to destroy passing down faith to our children and having a, a winning home. I remember when I was in, in youth ministry. Uh, I spent three and a half years, in, almost four years in youth ministry, and I've mentioned this uh, at various times, but... The kids that really seem to take hold of Christ and take hold of faith came from one of two types of homes. Believe it or not, they were from home. Some of my best kids, some of the kids that are in ministry today and, and some of the kids who are raising uh, uh, their children in, in the way of the Lord today, that now they've grown up, they came from homes where there was absolutely no spiritual emphasis. Moms and dads didn't care about church. They didn't bring them to church. Actually, I'd have to go get them. They'd have to ride with someone. They, they came from those homes where, where they would come to church by themselves. Uh, no one in their home really thought faith was important. Or they would come from homes over here that were the exact opposite. They were homes where faith and Christianity and Christ was real. And it, 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 it was a part of everything that they did. That family made decisions on what the Bible said and it was a part of the conversation and these parents were praying for their kids and the kids today that, that are out and they're, they're serving the Lord and they're following the Lord they came from one of those one, by and large one of those two types of homes either total commitment to Christ or absolute no commitment to Christ what was ironic was that there was a third group of kids that I watched for four years of ministry and as I've watched other churches and been in ministry uh, as a pastor I've seen this happen the kids that almost always left and went and did their own thing and, and Christianity and Christ was not important you know what kind of homes they had? they had the kind of homes that talked about God that talked about Christ went to church but outside of that hour or a couple of hours during the week, it never affected their life. Mom and dad walked out of the church and their life was totally opposite of what they portrayed in church. These kids, they, they, they were solid. Those kids over there were solid. The, the homes that they're building are solid. But this area here was, was a little different. And, and why? Because there was that element of integrity. Now, that's not always the case, but by and large, uh, it seemed to be uh, the rule in those that, that I observed. So, so we talked about having that balanced team, and uh, we talked about how, how we have to point our children in the right direction, and that, that we have to, dad has to be uh, the disciplinarian, and mom is that gentle rain. And uh, that sometimes can become a hurricane. I don't know, we didn't have any hurricanes this week, all right? No hurricanes? All right, good deal. Well, I'm glad. Uh, but, but, but anyway, um, we talked about how that, that plays out. Uh, and sometimes that as a father, my objective and my job is to love, and to lead, and to listen. That changes the temperature in our homes. And so we come back today, and now we're talking about touchdowns. What does a score look like? 
What does a win look like in our homes? How do we put points on the board? So let me begin, uh, first of all, with a question. I think I have it here uh, on the slide. Um, let's see. First of all, let's see if it's on the slide. Uh, now, here's the question I want to ask you. Just think about this for a moment. Why did God create marriage? You don't have to answer it. I just want you to think about that for a moment. Why did God decide, okay, here is Adam. I know because Adam was all alone and, um, and, and the Bible says that man, it's not good for man to be alone so God wanted somebody to be with him. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's part of it. But, but why? What was the purpose? Once he created Adam, yes, Adam needed someone, but what was the purpose uh, of, of structuring the marriage to have a home and to, to raise children? I, I think that's, that's one question that I want us uh, to, to consider. Um, second question is, what is the ultimate objective, objection of raising kids? What is our ultimate objective of raising our, our children? Let me just ask you, I want you to think through this. What would you want your, once our children leave home, once our children grow up, what is it that you want your child to be characterized by? Do you want them to be academically successful? Do we want them to be athletically successful? Or do we want them to be socially successful? Or do we want them to be a person of faith and character? Now, by and large, I know what most of you are going to say and what I would say. Oh, we, I want all. I want my children to be athletic. I want, them to be, I want them to excel academically. I want them to be able to get along socially. I want them to be a, a person of faith and character. But if you have to choose one, if you're going to really desire and pray for one of those, which one of those do you want? Well, chances are this morning that most of us would say, you know, I want my children to be a person of Faith is important to you or you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have got up this morning and got ready and went through the hassle of getting here if you didn't think faith was important. And so everyone in here, we want our children to be a person of faith. We want them to be people of character. We want them to be honest and be men or women of integrity. We want them to be true and we want them to live right and we want them to add to society and we want them to be a help. There may be a lot of reasons and answers to why God created marriage and what we want our children to look like. But I believe there's a verse that answers that and I want to ask you to take your Bible and turn to Malachi. The book of Malachi. That's the last book in the New Testament just a very small book, just four or five chapters. A verse that I ran across uh, some time ago and it really, the Lord really spoke to me about it, really used it to challenge me in my own life. I want you to look at Malachi chapter 2. Uh, look at verse 15. <clears throat> Did he not, he's talking about, um, well, let's back up to verse 14. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth. To, you, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So God's talking about the home, husband and wife. But then he asked a question in verse 15. Did he make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? Uh, and, and then he goes on, and what was the one God seeking? Right? In essence, he says this, why did God make husband and wife one. Why did he create man and woman? Why did he bring man and woman together? What's his objective? Why did he commission them to have a covenant relationship and then to, to raise children? Why? Why? Well, continue reading. And what was the one that God seeking? Here's the answer. Godly offspring. Godly offspring. I don't know. Uh, somebody, somebody, somebody help me out. We're on 
just kind of branch away here for a minute. This is the this is the ESV. Let's just see what some some of you may have different translations. How does your translation answer that this morning? If you're reading from a different translation than what I'm reading from, David, what is your godly seed? Godly seed. Anybody else have something a little different? Offspring. Okay. So so here's the point. When we're looking at this, this is what Malachi is saying. God asks this question. Why did, why did God bring man and woman together? Why did he create marriage? And in marriage, why did he create and command to have children? And here's the answer. He wanted us to produce godly seed or godly offspring. If I have to say if there is one objective to marriage... Yes, there's fulfillment, and yes, there is relationship, but that is not the ultimate objective of the home. You know what the ultimate objective of the home is? It is to raise godly children. Now, let me just say this. I'm not here this morning to make... There's no way that you can guarantee this. But men, boys and girls and men and women have their own free will. Uh, and, and sometimes people walk away from the Lord. They have that, that option. There is nothing that's going to guarantee uh, this because we have a free will and, and sin in our, in our life. Matter of fact, I've told people before, when someone once say that God really had two sons in the sense that he had Adam, he made Adam, and he had, had Christ, and one of them sin and one of them went away and chose to disobey God. So regardless of, of what happens, our the goal and the objective is still for us to raise godly seed. How, and, and I say that because to me, and I believe according to scripture, that is a win. We want to know what it looks like to, to put points on the board. The objective is as a mom and a dad to come together and raise godly children. That is why this morning that I am giving away this book. I want to put resources in your hands to help us. I'm in the process of reading this book right now uh, myself. But, but that is our objective. So, let's go back to the first question. What is the ultimate objective of raising our kids? Is it, and I mentioned, is it to be academically successful, athletically? Uh, is it to be socially or to be a person of faith? Well, the third question that I would ask is, I believe that's there, is how much of our time and energy and resources are going toward that objective? If we want our families to be families of faith and character, how much of our time and energy and resources are going to accomplish that? And so as we come to Proverbs 3, I think we get an idea of what a score looks like. What it looks like to put points on the board to run the play. Matter of fact, notice with me in Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 4. This is uh, in Solomon talking to his son. He says this in verse 3. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Why? Verse 4. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. The best thing that I can do for my family and we can do for our families to help them achieve success in this world is this. Impress faith upon them. Now, I've mentioned this before and I, it's worth saying again. A lot of people, a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I want my kids to make their own decision. You know, I don't, I really don't want to, I don't want to push them toward Christianity because I'm afraid that if I, if I push them uh, to, to church uh, and whatever, you know, that they'll grow up and hate it. Any of you ever heard that? Yeah. That's the craziest philosophy I ever heard of. If you, have, if you put that in life, if you really believe that, this is what that looks like. I don't want to make my kids take a bath. You know, I'll just let them decide if they take a bath because the last thing I want is them to grow up and hate cleanliness. So, you know, I'm just going to sit back and if they, if they feel like they ought to be people who, who take baths, 
then that'll, that'll, that'll be, or I don't, I don't want to make them go to school. You know, I, 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 I tell them every morning at 7.30 or 6.30, all right, it's time to go to school. Uh, if you want to go, you can go. No, you know what we do? We get up and we say, you're going to school. No, you're not. You get out that door and we drag them. Man, we drag them out the door. We, man, we, we scream and holler and push and fuss. And I don't care. No, you. Let, oh, you ain't hot. It's only 100. Your temperature is only 102. That's, you can still go to school with that. You need to get in there. You got to learn. That's the way we do things here. I don't care if you don't want to brush your teeth. Get in there and brush it. We never say, oh, man, I hope that they don't grow up hating to brush their teeth. We never say, I hope that... I hope that this doesn't cause them to not want to go to college, me forcing this on them. No, our job as parents is to impress faith upon our kids. And verse 4 says this, the best thing that we can do, if, we will, if, if, if our children and our families will have the Word of God at the center, those, those children will grow up to find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. As I was reading that this week and preparing, I thought of another verse. I believe it's over in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. You don't have to turn there. But there's a verse in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, talking about Jesus as he was growing. And it said, and he grew in stature and in favor with God and men. Wow. You mean Jesus' life, as Jesus grew, he, he grew in such a way that that his life became pleasing to God, and not only pleasing to God, but as men and women looked at him, they were, they were pleased by what they saw, and he grew in favor. That's the exact phrase that Solomon uses here. That the best thing that we can do, ultimately the best thing that we can do to try to create children that emulate the life of Christ is to impress our faith on them. So let's hurry. A lot of blanks this morning, and so I won't spend a lot of time on these. But let me, if you're taking notes, let's go through these. What does this touchdown look like? Let's begin with the winning play. There has to be a play. In football, if you're going to score a touchdown, there's a play that gets the job done. Well, here's, here's the play for this. Number one, we must own a biblical faith. We must own a biblical faith. Notice chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teachings, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace will they add to, your, to you. Notice that. These are, he didn't write these. He didn't write the Bible. But he, had, he took ownership. And what was it? He was taking his faith. He was taking God's word and he, he was making it his own. And so, so we as parents, the first thing that we've got to do is we must, we must own a biblical faith. We have to make Christianity, we have to make the word of God a part of our own life. That's to be a part of us. Secondly, we must share God's word with our kids. We must share God's word with our kids. Once again, in this whole chapter and throughout this book, you know what's going on? It is a dad, it is a mom speaking into the life of their children, trying to find every opportunity. We looked at it last week uh, out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, how we are to talk with our kids. By the way, and as we go along, it first becomes a part of our life. Matter of fact, what did, what, did, what did it say in Deuteronomy 6? That we write these on the table of our hearts. And then as we write them on the table of our heart, then they are able to come out. Our problem is this so often. We don't take ownership of God's Word, and it never becomes a part of our heart and our life, so it's more difficult for us to spit it out. Right? So we have to take ownership of that. Third, We must focus on the heart and not just the behavior. We must focus on the heart and not just the behavior. Notice this. Let not, verse 3, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your, next word, heart. 
Can I, let me just be very honest and transparent with you. If there is one, if there's, I struggle in a lot of areas, but if I had to say there's an area that I have to really struggle with, this is, this is the area that I struggle with. As a parent, here is our, here's our default system. Is that we have this idea of the way we should live and the way our children should behave. And when they don't, we want to correct what? The behavior. You stop doing that. Why can't I do that, mama and daddy? Is your answer the same as mine? Because I told you. Because I said. You ever said that? Yeah. We, why, why can't? Why should I stop that? Because I said so. That's why. That's all you need to know. Well, is there a place for that? Absolutely. There's a place in the sense that we are the authority. But here's the problem. If we spend our life as parents just correcting behavior and we don't try to help our children understand and change their heart, it doesn't work. And what does Solomon say? He is saying this, Son, these things are on my heart. And I want you to write them on your heart. So I don't want you just to change your behavior. I want you to change your heart. And so what, what we have to do sometimes is not just change the behavior. We have to sit down with our children. And when they say, why can't I, why, why can't I do this? We have to say, well, the reason you can't do that is because that is disrespectful. And, and the problem with disrespect is, is that, number one, it violates the Word of God. It violates the nature of God. It, it, it is degrading to another person. You see, we have to bring, we have to chase. And this is where parenting becomes very tough. This is the tough aspect of parenting, is that, is that when we have to tell our, our family why they can do this or why they can't do this, we have to grab a hold, we have to figure out what the, the theme or the string is, and we have to follow this back. And we say, okay, all right, here's the reason. Ted, I believe it's Ted Tripp wrote a book called Shepherding a Child's Heart. I would recommend that book, Shepherding a Child. And the whole idea is that we as parents sometimes, we're like John Wayne. We just kind of want to mosey on in and we just want to kind of, we're, we're, the, we're the sheriff. And because we're the sheriff, everybody's going to do what we say. And if they're, they don't do what we say, then there's going to be punishment. We're going to lock everybody up. Well, that is our tendency. Now, can I tell you this? You want to know why we parent that way? Number one, because that's the easy way to parent. And we'll always take the easy course if we have to. Secondly, that's probably the way we were parenting. So as a parent, we have to break the trend. And, and so the winning play is, number one, we, get, we receive Christ as our Savior. We own God's Word. We own our own faith. And then we instill it into our kids. We, we share God's Word with our kids. Why? Because we are focusing on changing the heart and not just the behavior. Because if we have heart change, then it will be lasting change. And we don't have to worry as much. Third, or secondly, what does a win look like? I'm going to go through these very quickly this morning. What, what does a win look like in, in our lives? And all of us in some ways are, are still children. We're growing in this area. What does it look like in our own life? We're God's children. I'm not, now, now, I'm not just talking about us as moms and dads uh, in that regard, but we're children as well. If we know Christ, God is our Father, and how, how should we live our life? Well, number one, there is a reception of God's Word. Look at verse three, chap, chapter 3, verse 3. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. He's about, he's about to move through these. As a matter of fact, when you score, interestingly enough, when you score a touchdown, there's six points. You kick the field goal, there's seven. Well, these are, there's seven points here that I want to give you. We're going to put seven points on the board. Number one, there's a reception of God's Word. What does a win look like in our life and in our family's life? When we try to train our children and they receive God's Word, we as children ourselves, when we receive God's Word. Secondly, there is trust in God's leading. 
Look at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. Coming to that place in our life where our children and we as, we as children say, okay, God, I don't fully understand what you're doing, but I'm going to trust you. I'm placing my whole life in your hand. And it may, it may look like, okay, God, if that's your will, I will do it. It, it. it may look like, okay, Lord, I don't know how this is going to handle it, but I'm not going to try to take care of it on my own. I'm trusting you. There is trust in God's leading. Third, look at verse 5. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. The third, the third win looks like this. There is a rejection of our own personal wisdom. There is a rejection of our own personal wisdom. That we don't go on our own idea. Me and some of the guys have talked about this. I read a statement recently uh, that went something like this. We talk about follow your heart. I read recently a guy said, don't follow your heart. Lead your heart. Our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So my goal, uh, my goal should not be to follow my heart and my own understanding. Why? Because I'm sinful. Usually what I want to do is going to be going away from God's Word. And, and, and so a win in my life and in the lives of my family is that we reject our own personal wisdom. No, I'm not going to go by the, the theme of the day. I'm not going to go with by what feels good or what feels right to me. I'm going to, I'm going to analyze God's Word. I've received God's Word. I'm going to trust this is right. And now because I'm trusting this is right, I'm going to reject all of the other. Fourth, look at verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your he will make straight your paths. There is a pursuit of a greater knowledge of God. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will the word acknowledge literally means to make heavy. To make heavy. The idea is that in every decision that you make, you make God's will heavy in your life about that. You acknowledge Him in every area. So, so I am pursuing this greater knowledge of God. Look at verse 7. We, and I read, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. There is a life-altering respect for God. There's a life-altering respect for God. Fear the Lord and what? Turn from evil. In my life, when it comes down to whether I sin or not, it really boils down to do I love God and do I fear Him? Because every sin is a sin against God. Everything that I do that is wrong, that's truly wrong, if I trace it back to its seed, I find that it is something that violates the nature and the, and the character of God. And be, in doing that, I hurt Him. And so true love and respect for God says, no, I don't want to do anything that, that would hurt Him. And so a win in our life and a win in our family's life is that our love for God alters our life. Look at verse 9. And we hurried. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Number one, there is an emphasis on the glory of God. The word honor, mean, it can also mean glory. That in everything that we do, we are bring, we're trying to bring glory to God. And then last of all, seven, look at verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his proof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. The last thing that a win looks like is there is a continuation in difficult times. There is a continuation in difficult times. Solomon says, son, I want you to understand that God, the people that God loves, he corrects, he chastens, he, he, he chastises, he disciplines the very thing that we talked about last week. As a father, he does that in our life. He says, and when that happens, and it's difficult, don't run away from it. Don't reject God because things are hard in our lives. When God corrects you or when you're going through a struggle, don't run away from it. And so what Solomon is saying is, he's saying, son, here's, here's really what I want. I want. I want my faith to be real in my life. I want God's word to be a part of my heart. 
I want God's word to alter my heart and not just my behavior. And when it does, then I want to pass that on to you. And I want you to make that a part of your heart. And as, as God's children, as, as children of God, that's, that's our goal. That's what He wants for us. And then, as parents, that winning play, all of these things, that is a score. And I don't know. Sometimes I look, and one of the things that I, so one of the things that I love the most is I look at, I've got mentors and I've got family, uh, I've got friends that, that they're way down the road, they're grandparents now, and I look and I see, I, I see how they've been married for 50 and 40 and 50 years, and they, they still have this strong, loving relationship. Not only do they have this strong, loving relationship, but they've got these kids that, that love God, and they're serving God. And when I watch that and when I see it, deep in my heart, I say, oh, Lord, that's what I want. And as I, as I look, maybe at the end of the day, maybe at the end of, the li- end of my life, if there's anything that would make me dance... If there's anything that would make me spike the ball and shake my hands and say, yeah. It would let me know that my relationship is strong with my wife. And my children are serving the Lord. That's my prayer. I told someone not long ago, we were talking about churches and and, thing, and pastors, sometimes we can get so caught up in, in churches and we can find our identity in in how our church is going and what's happening at church. That's a struggle, that'll battle. But I told a guy not long ago, I said, you know what? I'm about to come to the place in my life where, where really I only have two goals. Well, I want my church, I want Clearview to, to, to do well and I want us to grow and reach people. But I said, you know what? If I come to the end of my life and, and, and I end my life and my marriage is strong and my children love God, then I'll be, that'll, that'll be successful enough for me. And can I say to you this, this morning, will you make that your prayer for you? And would you pray that for me? And can I pray that for you? That wherever we are in our relationships, that the strength and the joy of our life would be that we would experience the joy of a score. And we begin wherever we're at. How do we do that? By passing on God's wisdom into our own life and into the lives of others.